Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Molly Mantel, your Librarian-elect, and I'm delighted to be hosting this panel at the Oxford Union in partnership with One Young World. One Young World is the global forum for young leaders. They're an international NGO that ident identifies, promotes, and connects the world's most powerful, impactful young leaders to create a better world with more responsible and more effective leadership. The annual One Young World Summit convenes the brightest young talent from every country and sector, working to accelerate social impact. Delegates from more than 190 countries are counseled by influential political, business, and humanitarian leaders, such as Justin Trudeau, Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Edward Enifel, and Emma Watson, to name just a few. The One Young World Summit 2021 will take place in Munich, Germany, from the 22nd to the 25th of July. This event is the most international in the world, second only to the Olympics. At the end of the summit, delegates become One Young World ambassadors. They return to their communities and organizations with the means and motivation to make a difference, accessing the, glo accessing the global network for over 12,000 young leaders, apologies, to accelerate existing initiatives or establish new ventures. Between summits, the One Young World community participates in an ongoing program of opportunities, including caucuses, funding, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, media exposure, and speaking engagements. One Young World also partners with over 190 global businesses, NGOs, and educational institutions, boasting the largest corporate footprint of any organization in the third sector. I'm honored to be joined by such a great group of speakers today to discuss gender equality, overcoming the politics of exclusion. Hope Solo is one of the most successful goalkeepers in the history of women's football and represented the US national team from 2000 to 2016. From her early steps towards a football career at the University of Washington, she went on to success at the highest level of the game, claiming two Olympic gold medals and a World Cup victory in 2015. With two golden gloves at consecutive tournaments, she was the undisputed best goalkeeper in the world for a number of years. As a representative for Women's Sport Foundation, alongside her work with many other charitable causes, she has been a tireless voice for women and girls in sport worldwide. Alongside her teammates, she was the subject of the documentary Keeping Score, which focused on gender equality in the run-up to the Rio Olympics. Jamira Burley was a One Young World 2018 Deloitte ambassador. Currently, she is the head of youth engagement and skills for the Global Business Coalition for Education and the co-founder of Project Z, helping to ensure a collaborative relationship between youth, bilateral agencies, governments, and business leaders to enable innovative ways to educate, educate, engage, and activate young people around the world. She was named White House Champion of Change, Forbes 30 Under 30, Global Leadership Awardee for Vital Voices, and selected as an MIT Media Lab Fellow. Amanda Huen, is the CEO and founder of RISE. She penned her own civil rights into existence and passed the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights after having to navigate the broken criminal justice system after her own rape. The federal law was the 21st bill in modern US history to pass unanimously on the record and served as a model for 15 other laws protecting sexual violence survivors throughout the nation. Amanda has also been named a Forbes 30 and 30, 30, a top 100 leading global thinker by Foreign Policy, Young Woman of the Year by Marie Claire, and the Tempest number one Women of Color Trailblazer. Previously, Amanda was appointed by President Barack Obama to the US State Department as White House Deputy, Deputy White House Liaison. In 2018, Amanda was nominated for the 2019 Nobel Peace Prize. And finally, Trisha Shetty. Shetty founded She Says, an Indian nonprofit that empowers the country's women to act against sexual violence by providing education, Legal, legal, medical, and psychological support. So far, the organization has engaged more than 60,000 young people through educational workshops and on online, creating awareness and support for survivors who often reach out to share their personal stories and ask for help through She Says social media platforms. She Says also partners with the country's universities and other so social organizations to raise awareness of these issues. Welcome to you all. Um, to begin, could you tell us all a little bit about your work on gender equality and what you've sought to achieve in your own careers? Let's start with Hope. Uh, 
Well, first, I think it's important um, to understand that the laws here in America are incredibly different. Um, so in 1963, um, federal law was put into effect for the Equal Pay Act, as well as Title VII. It was signed into law by John F. Kennedy. Um, it specifically states that if you have the same employer, if you have the same job description and the same responsibilities, then one cannot discriminate based off of gender. So this is federal law here in the United States. And almost 60 years later, we are still fighting for something that is already in, in law. And, um, you know, it was important to me, you know, for, for decades, I realized the nuances and the differences between men's professional sports and women's prof professional sports, especially with the United States Olympic team, where there should be no disparity. So America claims to be the leaders of the free world. And because we enforce our politics around the world, we have to be held accountable to our own laws here in the United States. And yet we still are not. So I became the first athlete to um, file a federal lawsuit against my employer, the United States Soccer Federation on both equal pay and Title VII. Um, so we are still uh, in court right now. About nine months later, the current US Women's National Soccer Team filed a class action lawsuit. Um, and now I continue to meet on Capitol Hill with congressmen and women with United States senators um, to uphold the laws. Um, and we continue to have ongoing hearings. Um, so we're working a lot with Congress and the United States Senate. And that is one thing where here in America, politics and sports go hand in hand. And um, we're hoping, um, you know, this has been filed back in 2016. So we've been in the court system for quite some time. It's a lot of work, um, it takes a lot of patience. A lot of court documents have to be read. Um, we have a lot of public support, but at the end of the day, we still have to win through the court system 60 years later after federal law was put into effect. So that's where we're at right now. I also have um, a complaint with the United States Olympic Committee to make sure that all national governing bodies um, amateur sports here in America does not discriminate, um, not just with gender, but socioeconomically and really give an opportunity to all amateur soccer players here in America and not just professional athletes. And right now we're finding that that funding as a national governing body and a nonprofit organization under the United States Olympic Committee and the Ted Stevens Act, most of that finance and the monies are going to the professional men's teams and it is not distributed equally amongst all the soccer constituents here in the United States. So we have two major complaints, one in federal court and one with the USOC right now. And Jamira. Um, thank you again for having me and super excited to be a part of this program. A lot of the work that I do is raising awareness and putting pressure on governments around the world to increase its GDP for global education. If there's one thing we know is that currently now we're faced with the largest youth population around the world. There's about 1.8 billion young people who are being trained and educated for an entire ecosystem that no longer exists. And the vast majority of, of them are girls. Um, and so a lot of the work that we do is to draw the correlation between one, why it's important for local governments to invest in education for marginalized communities, particularly for girls, but more importantly, how can we ensure that the roadblocks that institutions, that governments, that religion oftentimes place for girls to be able to receive equal access to education in their particular country. Um, if we know one thing is true is that when you educate a girl, you actually invest and educate an entire community. And so my goal is to ensure that wherever a young girl is growing up, whether it's in the, the south side of Chicago or in villages in Sudan, that they have access to quality education that will enable them to reach their full potential and to be an active participant in society. Um, regardless where they might call home. Um, Amanda. First of all, thank you so much for having me. What an incredible group of people. Um, I'm really, really honored to be here and to learn from everyone as well. You know, my background is that I'm a super nerd. I actually come from the astrophysics world and my dream was to be an astronaut, but life happened like 1.3 billion 
um, people on this planet. I uh, was raped and I still remember walking out of the hospital after my rape kit procedure in Boston and feeling so lonely, you know, feeling like, well, where do I go from here? And when I found out that the American criminal justice system really stacks the deck against survivors, I felt so betrayed. You know, I had grown up uh, believing in these sacrosanct um, ideas of equality under the law, justice, and yet survivors are told to go to the hospital, go to the police. And when we do, we are met with something, to me, which is way worse. Um, in my case, I had to fight for my evidence. I called a rape kit um, to be not destroyed before it was even tested, because in Massachusetts, before my law passed, it would be routinely destroyed, untested, at six months, even if the statute of limitations is 15 years. I thought that was really unfair. Uh, and when I spoke about my story, so many other people responded saying, hey, as a survivor or as a loved one of a survivor, I've also experienced these injustices um, in many parts of the United States. Survivors aren't given, notif or given notices of their rights. Survivors aren't um, given access to their own medical records or, or police reports. So my team and I wrote the Sexual Assault Survivor Bill of Rights and passed it unanimously through Congress. Um, but that's only where the story starts, because since that moment, after President Obama signed it in 2016, over a million people reached out all around the world and said, hey, you don't look like a lawmaker or what it usually means to be a lawmaker. And so if you are in your 20s, a woman, a person of color, and you're able to do this, maybe I can do this too. So what RISE has been working on um, for the past several years is helping people find their own voices, elevating that, and helping people pen their own civil rights into existence, um, no matter what issue it is. Um, and in particular, that's because we believe that well, democracy should be accessible for all. If we're um, in America, we're going to leave, live up to that um, constitutional right of a more, you know pursuit of a more perfect union, the ability to petition our government. Um, but really, the people who have the solutions to the world's most pressing problems are the people who live that problem every day. So they need to be at the drafting table, uh, and that's what we do at Rice. Thank you, and finally, Tricia. Um, again, to echo Amanda, thank you for bringing us together and thank you Hope, Shamira and Amanda for sharing your truth. Um, so I'm a lawyer and uh, I, I call India my home. We, you know, a lot of people are aware of the gruesome rape incident that happened on a bus um, a few years ago that led to, you know, protests and people coming down to the streets and demanding for change in laws because back then rape was defined purely as penile penetration of the vagina. And what happened on the bus was they ended up inserting metal rods, you know, in the women's vagina. And there was no sort of definition for that crime. Um, not that the crime was not happening and women's bodies were not being subject to it. So we started, she says, um, with the motto to be need driven more than cause driven. And by that, I just mean trying to identify, uh, you know, okay, we have great laws, but who has access to those laws? How can people seek access to justice? And what does justice look like uh, on ground? And, you know, the work that we do is really simple. I actually will be bold enough to say, um, I, take, uh, I, I take umbrage to technological based inventions uh, that will that, that claim to uh, aid women's safety because I don't think they do based on all of my experience. Um, we just, you know, walked on ground. We, if we got calls from survivors, from parents whose children were raped, we showed up in police stations, we showed up in hospitals, we showed up in courtrooms, just a really simple rudimentary work. But all that work for us helped shape our advocacy. Um, so we are an unapologetic, youth-read feminist organization. And, uh, you know, sanitary napkins were getting taxed in India. Our tax system was going through a revamp where we had GST being introduced, which meant no more states could no more have individual taxes. It was going to be a centralized tax system. And we said, now is a great time to talk about how menstrual hygiene products must be tax-free. Um, of course, uh, you know, 
no one really cared at that time. No, no celebrity would lend their support because it was menstruation. Um, we ended up uh, tying up with Global Citizen. A petition got about 30,000 signatures, didn't really you know, uh, pick up steam. We filed multiple PILs and uh, submissions to the government, all agencies possible, the Ministry of Women and Child Development, uh, to family planning, everything. We had multiple asks, nothing worked. Um, we had a member of parliament who plagiarized our petition and it ended up being an opposition party uh, demand then, which if anyone knows anything about this current government that is uh, governing India knows that they would never listen to anything that is an opposition led demand. And when I reached out to her uh, to kind of figure out how do we uh, join forces after she's plagiarized our my article word for word, I remember distinctly her, her PA telling me you play in your league and we will play in our league. Um, and well, we did. We ended up launching the largest uh, campaign to uh, lobby for menstrual hygiene products to be uh, tax free globally. We reached over 24 million impressions on Twitter alone in less than 24 hours. We did not spend a single penny for this campaign. Uh, it went viral. And Sure enough, the government that did not listen to any of our legal uh, uh, pleas ended up listening to social media and uh, you know dropped the tax. Um, where we currently stand, and I think this is critical to note, is I am in a country right now where you know you introduced me uh, with wonderful adjectives and words. Uh, I get called an Obama scholar, a Paris Peace Forum, you know, president, ta -ta -ta. but back home I'm called anti-national, I'm called a terrorist. And the reason I'm setting this context is because, you know, uh, resistance uh, to be woke, uh, to be uh, standing up for human rights is uh, still an accepted way of thought and being in global north countries. And when I say global north, I mean based on finances, not based on geography. But if you belong to the global south, we are targeted. Uh, we are arrested. We are subject to extreme sort of uh, vicious trolling online. And uh, these are the best case scenarios. Worst case, you get, a, you get a bullet to your head, right? Just today, I was talking about how one of our comrades has had an income tax raid in his house uh, because he dared to speak up. Uh, a few, uh, one of our comrades is in jail uh, for many months. Uh, you know, this is a routine conversation for us. I highlight this because when we talk about gender equality, I realized this very early on. You cannot talk about it without the intersection of politics and critically without the acknowledgement of bad leadership, right? And uh, you have to take that into account because all kinds of gender-based issues have that intersection, which basically our work uh, demands for us to not just fight against corporate interests and hegemonies of patriarchy that have been profiting off our bodies uh, and minds and souls, but also speak um, to power to uh, elected officials who, who claim that we are the world's largest democracy, but are debasing democracy every single minute, every single day. And in this climate, right, in this specific climate, you talk about politics of in exclusion. In this particular climate, Gates Foundation saw it fit to award our prime minister an award uh, for his exceptional work on pushing for the SDGs. All while uh, he was actively committing human rights atrocities. And I would love to challenge the Gates Foundation to give an award to Donald Trump for his exceptional work in pushing for human rights, but they wouldn't. But it's okay to do that to my people and the people that have the color of skin that I do. So again, I'm bringing forward the intersection of country and color because that's very important because when Notre Dame burns, the whole world starts tweeting. But when my country is burning, our people are being jailed, women leaders are being sexually abused in prison, beaten and especially the caste angle that then comes into it uh their bodies are subject to the worst kind of atrocities everyone does not want to talk about it because uh, they want access to india whilst ignoring the lives at the end of it thank you so much um trisha i was wondering if you could say a bit more about how we could change our legislative and governmental systems to better support women and girls uh by knowing that leadership is inherently weak they're cowards uh, so they will look at the direction where uh, it's popular, where it's sexy, right? So uh, their, their, their politics is governed by Twitter trends. 
regardless of which country you belong to. So you got to hack the system. And Amanda, you know, knows really well how to hack the system. And as women, we inherently know how to hack the system. Um, so you got to hack the system. You've got to flood social media. You have to make your issue a cool issue that everyone wants to talk about. Um, you have to make it intersectional, where all genders are lending their support to it. Um, you have to make it accessible where you're speaking in languages that the people understand you know often the problem is we dream and talk in english without accounting for that fact that most of our population is rural and they don't speak english so i could never speak like this uh, if i'm lobbying to my people back home and expect for them to change policies because i don't look like most of them right there is an inherent disconnect uh, so accounting for all of that and also recognizing, you know, uh, as Dave Chappelle said, where the power lies, the power lies with the people. Um, and uh, you have to name and shame them unapologetically. Uh, it's, uh, it's this concept of, you know, uh, not just insulting someone, but uh, insulting someone in the way that you really attack their dignity because they are attacking our dignity and our human rights. And this concept of speaking up politely without offending our oppressors is something that just doesn't work. They want to sanitize us because they don't know what to do with us. This concept of respectability when speaking up against your oppressors is, excuse my French, bullshit. So don't listen to the people that are going to tell you to be more palatable. Uh, find an incredible group of people that support you. Uh, make sure your support gets, make sure your issue gets international support because no government uh, wants to have their international image tarnished. If, if, if we've learned anything from MBS in Saudi Arabia to our country, uh, you know that they want to sanitize their, their image in foreign platforms. So uh, use social media, hack the system, uh, make sure you have global solidarity and support and uh, have a great therapist on call because this job is going to break you uh, you're going to spend many days crying. Uh, it, it, they, they design the system in a way where you start questioning your sanity. So have a great therapist on call. And don't forget to have an identity beyond your work. For me, it just involved being able to give myself permission to dance. Thank you. Amanda, would you like to say some more on this? <laughs> no, I, I love you, Trisha. So we should catch up um, and post-COVID dance together. Uh, I love your quote, leadership uh, is meek because I feel like I've been searching for that for a really long time. It's absolutely true that there are people, especially those who are in you know, status quo, who want to keep it that way. And in order for us to advance and, well, get people to see our human dignity, it's crucial that we have these really tough conversations and continue to call out folks, you know, um, that, the legislative process is one way in which one can create change. You know, for for me, it's a consistent question of law versus culture. You know, which one comes first, chicken or the egg? But honestly, I think obviously the answer is both. Um, that you have to, for instance, make sure that these stories of your issue are being told in a responsible way. That journalists are covering your issue in a responsible way, while at the same time using these platforms to call on you know, these systematic structures that have excluded women um, for so long, right? And uh, when we think of systems that are in place, our education system, uh, the legal system, you know, um, even Hollywood in itself is a system, um, all of these places seem to have one thing in common and it's that when folks talk about their truth, their talk about equality, all of a sudden our very existence is seen as a threat. And why is that when these all these places espouse virtues of uh, including us? Why is it that these very places that celebrate us and use us for their monetary gain, all of a sudden when we ask, oh, well, okay, let's live up to the thing that you just said, flip. Right? Um, if there's that disconnect, that means that there should be some change that's happening. Um, so I, I, I often say peace is not the absence of visible conflict, you know, and in order for there to be peace, we need to hold up a torch and light up the darkest corners of human experience, uh, which means, yes, we're going to see some ugly things, um, but it is only by um, first accepting and realizing what is the issue um, and acknowledging that there is a problem that we can move forward and heal. You know? So I, I couldn't agree more with um, my panelists. Thank you. And Hope, could you tell us a bit more about your personal experience sort of trying to raise a light to these issues? 
Yeah, of course. Um, first off, Trisha, I just want to say um, your story really pulls up my heart and brought me a little bit emotional and everybody's fight on this panel is absolutely incredible. I think um, a lot of times I've, I have felt in this fight, um, you know, to be quite honest, it's a fight for a good living, you know, a good wage. This isn't a fight for, uh, you know, somebody raping me or owning my own body or the injustices that all of you have in your different communities in your different country. And I recognize that this, um, I believe wholeheartedly in this fight for equal pay because I do believe America has to abide by their own laws to continue to be leaders around the world. So this is my particular fight, but um, you know, thinking about how privileged I am to be able to fight for this, um, especially on a panel with, with all of you, you know, I'm very aware of that, but I also know that fighting for equal pay has an influence around the world um, for future generations, for future young girls. Um, so it is incredibly important to me, but I know that I'm shaking hearing, you know, the, the incredible personal stories from, from all of you. Um, what I wanted to say in regards to what you had to say, Amanda, is responsible journalism. That, that is a struggle um, here in America and of course, everywhere you look. Um, but that is really neglected um, us being able to get this fight really going, especially during the Trump administration. Uh, we had this complaint in front of the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission for close to three years. And because of the lack of funding, um, the EEOC was also overworked and gender equality was not a huge platform under the Trump administration. So this complaint with the EEOC uh, was put on hold for three years before we were given the permission to actually file the lawsuit in federal court. It's the first step before you go to federal court. So what we have seen is that the sports media, you know, this is the, the United States Women's National Team is the most popular team in the, in, in the country. And they have won four World Cups. You know, they're one of the most successful teams worldwide. They're known not just here in America, but all around the world, you know, some of the biggest names in sports. And what we see is that the sports media through our entire fight for equality, they didn't wanna to touch this issue. They didn't wanna to touch this issue because they get their certification, they get their badges by the United States Soccer Federation. So if you wanna to come to the stadium and report on a game and keep your livelihood, keep your paycheck, then you're not gonna stand behind the players who fight, filed against the Federation. You're gonna stand with the Federation, this multi-million dollar Federation who writes everybody's paychecks. And it, that is what we're seeing. And we can't get sports journalists on our side. So we have to go to more responsible journalists, which is more usually on the political side, but a lot of political journalism doesn't wanna to touch sports, even though they do go hand in hand. So this, is, this has been, um, you know, we're trying to manage it and find our way. And with the new administration, um, President Biden has made it uh, very well known that U.S. soccer better step up to the plate and pay these women because they bring so much to the table for our country and for sports around the world. Um, so that, that's one of our major issues right now is we can't rely on responsible journalism. They tell the story, they confuse the public, um, they use U.S. soccer's numbers, um, and, and nothing is really factual. I have essentially, you know, I was the first one to speak up against this. And when you're speaking up against a corporation um, who's responsible, they have $170 million in surplus funds. I was told that I'm asking questions above my pay grade to just kick the soccer ball around the fields um, and do your job and the goal. And that was it. I wasn't supposed to speak up. I wasn't supposed to ask questions. I was supposed to just play soccer and win gold medals for our country. And that was it. And so when I started barking up the wrong tree, I got fired. I got silenced. I was one of the best commentators in the, in, in the 2019 World Cup, but I couldn't get a job in America. I had to work for BBC, which I love BBC, but um, I, I have not been hired from ESPN, from Fox, from... Uh, CBS, anybody who's associated with U.S. soccer. Um, Nike offered me a lifelong contract 
to not speak about these issues anymore, to not speak about uh, all of the discrepancies, not just with U.S. soccer, because Nike and U.S. soccer also, you know, do a lot of business together, um, but because Nike has their own issues. Nike pays <laughs> their women athletes, some of the most popular athletes in the world, next to nothing in comparison to the male athletes. So Nike, even though they sell shirts about equality, even though people get on the microphone and they act like they support it, they're making money off of our fight. So the way to create change is still up in the air for us because we have so many companies making money off our fight, but nobody is actually getting into the trenches and doing the work, meeting with Congress, meeting with senators, actually not being afraid to speak up. I have lost millions of dollars in contracts, in television contracts, and I have been completely blackballed from the soccer world because of this fight for equal pay. At the end of the day, I know I'm on the right side of history, but um, when you talk about the effects, I felt all alone. Um, I've had horrible days. I've been in tears. I wonder if it's worth the fight when I'm losing so much time with my family, when I'm losing so much money, when I'm losing so many opportunities. But at the end of the day, of course, I know it's worth it because I do know I'm on the right side of history. But I guess I come to you guys now asking, when you talk about responsible journalism, we don't see it. We have not seen it. And I guess I come to you guys asking for, um, you know, here we are in this free world here in America. And we're supposed to be able to have responsible journalism, but you start to lose faith in the system. And I think that's really incredibly hard. You have to continue to fight for all the young kids, you know, listening to our, our, our Zoom call here, you have to continue the fight. And what I've seen for so long is that when you have um, these huge corporations, they instill fear, um, there's intimidation tactics. They, for instance, the Federation, um, uh, at the onset of our fight, they said that they would take away all of our health insurance. People are afraid that they couldn't take care of their families, their kids, they had babies and they would no longer have health insurance. They threatened that they would no longer schedule games. So now it's really hard. What they do is they divide and conquer. It's one of the oldest uh, plays in the playbook. You know, that's how you can continue to move forward. You're gonna divide players, you're gonna conquer them. And they know what they're doing. You know, they're brilliant business minds. And we're looked at as just a bunch of girl athletes who need to, to, to kick the soccer ball around. So it's intimidating. It's tough. Um, it, it affects our family lives. It affects our professional lives. It affects everything. And we, we really have gotten at a point where it's so popular to talk about equality. It's so talky, popular to talk about equal pay. You see the reckoning in Hollywood with the sexual abuse and sexual harassment. Um, you see major names in Hollywood get taken down. So that now there is a sense of accountability finally, but it still feels like we're at a stalemate and we don't really know how to break through because you know, male chauvinism has just been institutionalized in every fabric of our society globally. And you're right, the people in power want to remain in power. And I always say silence never changed the world. So nobody will shut me up. I think they thought they'd shut me up, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, but yeah, we, we need all the help we can get to continue this fight, but we have been silenced. We have been silenced and there has not been responsible journalism in the process. Thank you. I completely agree. And um, as a teenage activist myself, I found that particularly my status as a sort of a young woman, a young girl was used continually to undermine me and, and the work that I was trying to do. And Jamira, I was wondering if you could speak a bit about that, particularly you started campaigning at just 15. How was that? Yeah, um, it, it's so crazy listening to all your stories. And it's a reminder that you know, all of this is by design. None of our issues work in silos. It is all perpetuated by institutions and individuals who, to your point, Hope, um, want to conquer, um, want to divide and conquer. You know, I, I grew up in West Philadelphia. My claim to fame is that I went to the same high school as Will Smith at different times, but nevertheless. And I grew up after um, the war on drugs and the crack epidemic. So I watched a lot of people either get in incarcerated or lose their life to gun violence. And when I, throughout the last 17 years as part of my activism, I realized oftentimes when you think about the issues related to gender violence, gun violence, criminal justice reform, when you think about how the U.S. has perpetuated our politics around the world, 
it is oftentimes the frontward facing or the public face to much deeper systematic problems wrong with all of our societies. And I think the, a lot of the work that I do is around you know, how to work with young people to use their voices to create change. And it's telling them that oftentimes change does not happen um, the traditional way that we've been told, right? It isn't happening through government oftentimes, um, despite the amazing work Amanda has done. It's oftentimes happening on the streets where protesters have to oftentimes put their bodies on the line to demand some form of justice in this country. And so I think one of the ways we move forward is not only holding all of these entities, the media, government, leaders, business leaders, accountable, but it's often at times asking us as communities is how can we work collectively together to be able to push these institutions to do more um, and to elevate the stories of those who have been impacted to create equitable change. Um, because oftentimes what we find is that we get distracted by the headlines or we get distracted by um, someone dropping a government dropping a bomb on another community that is oftentimes also living with the same poverty issues within its own um, country. And we forget about, um, or we get distracted for a moment by all of these systematic things wrong. So it's gonna take a long road to freedom and justice. Um, but I find that what, I, what brings me joy, I think is seeing so many young people who are using their voice, using their experiences, using their platform to push back against traditional institutions of power who are not showing up in the way in which they claim to be doing. Even if the US says we're a, a free country, I think um, COVID-19 has um, illuminated that we're not as free as we claim to be. And we perpetuated white supremacy, patriarchy and capitalism around the world and is impacting so many other marginalized communities. What work should we do? We be doing with young people specifically to help educate them about gender equality and, and the issues that they need to be talking about? I think one of it is actually showing young women that they are valued, that their stories matter, that they have a place and space and positions of power that were normally not created for them. Um, I think all of us are in, in a world in which we're operating in a world in which um, didn't create um, wasn't created for us to be using our voices, using our platform to push back and fight back. So it's definitely helping young women see their value. I think the other challenge is how do we create strong men who realize that they don't have to use violence, they don't have to use patriarchy as a way to be successful, that they can support the women in their lives and the women in their communities without creating harm. Uh, we put the pressure so often on women to, um, you know, dress appropriately, to say the right things, to act, um, to act professionally. When in, at the same time you have men and we have our sons and our and our brothers who are not acting accordingly in a way that's um, helping and um, and elevating women and their their stories and experiences in the workplace and outside of it. So it's a is a twofold um, working with girls to see their power and working with men to realize that they have a role to play to ensure gender equality around the world. Thank you, Trisha. Could you speak more about how um, the role of social media um, could play a part in this, especially with young people? Sure. And um, I just want to, before that, just, you know, um, piggyback on a few things that um, you mentioned, Hope. Firstly, thank you uh, for your bravery and your resilience and for, you know, fighting the good fight for all of us. Um, it worries me when people, you know, play into oppression Olympics, because um, we often, when we go to police stations to file a complaint, they'll be like, at least you didn't get raped. Oh, you got raped, at least you didn't get gang raped. At least your body wasn't mutilated. So, you know, uh, you should never have to kind of feel that your fight is in any way um, a, a, a less important fight than our fight, because it absolutely isn't. Um, and uh, another thing, you know, um, that upsets me, I take umbrage at, is that you have to sit and tell us the score record of uh, your team how many awards you'll have won, how well you'll have done. And you know, I will pitch it back to the conversation we have around the quota system, right? Every time we ask for equality, every time we ask for the quota system, they come back to us asking us to prove our meritocracy, right? They keep saying, what about meritocracy? God damn it. When I look up and see all the old white men in positions of power, don't talk to me about meritocracy. Y'all are mediocrity at best. Right, so don't talk to us about meritocracy when y'all are going around in your uh, uh, mutual masturbation society, uh, uh, praising each other's mediocrity. Um, so it's this constant thing about uh, pitting women against each other and asking us to prove our worth. You know what? To me, any woman 
who dares to breathe and uh, celebrate her agency is a warrior in my book because this system him was not was rigged from the very beginning to show us our place like you said hope you know uh fam ta girl shut up know your place right don't disturb people around you too much when you talk about social media um you are instantly villainized you are reduced down to your looks uh you're reduced down to your sex uh they will remind you in a very specific way about the fact that you're a woman they will they will describe your features they will tell you what they will do to your genitals right they will bring your family into it they will tell you that they will gang rape you and drop your dead body uh, in front of your parents so that your parents can see what they have done to your body these are all things that i receive on uh, you know a, a very uh, routine basis um i was getting severe death threats on instagram for the longest time the fbi was involved in my case um to basically pretty much tell me oops they can't do anything right this person would send me essays about exactly what he would do to my body how he would mutilate me how he would hold on to me whilst i'm taking my last breath and like how exactly he would rape me um and i have to tell you it completely messed me up i had depression anxiety all of the things uh, you know um and this is when again i talk so much about therapy because um our profession doesn't even give us the kind of space to expose our vulnerability let's be honest we talk about it after the fact hey i had my bad days but now i'm strong because truthfully i cannot show my weak my weakness i cannot show that i'm crying because that's what they want to do they want to get in your head right so with social media the one thing to remember is that cowards want to get in your head they want to silence you they want you to vacate the spaces the second you know that it kind of helps you know you know what i'm not going to give you that i'm not vacating the space i still respect the people who do choose to vacate it but the fact that i will not vacate the space the second thing is to show your support to each other to your fellow activists vocally publicly don't creep into our dms and tell us i support you i'm stand in solidarity but not do it publicly because the other side is organized right they have their whatsapp group chats they will send each other messages they will know exactly whom to target what hashtag to trend um, you know whom to blacklist so when the other side is so organized in their oppression and they are blacklisting you there are the amount of times i was i was uh, you know a top candidate for a job and i was told uh, i cannot be controlled uh, the amount of positions i have lost i had to tell myself that i will have no affinity to the space uh, that's invited me to speak so that i will never and that i'm perfectly okay not being reinvited to a place because that's the only thing that made me you know hold on to my truth and uh, because you come to a place where you start getting a seat at the table and then they trick you then they ask you to start uh, softening your tone right so they'll give you a seat at the table and then say now shut up now simmer down now dial you to your fight and that's when they trick you so i had to tell myself constantly you're perfectly fine not being reinvited and remind myself who what i'm fighting for and the final thing i just sum it up with we don't fight to win look with the amount of rape cases i've seen uh and how familiar i am with the judicial system not just here in uh, in, in across france i was uh, assaulted in france and someone just told me to suck it up and deal with it the amount of rape that goes unreported in france and the amount of intimate partner violence that happens and the reason i'm stating this is because any time i talk about you know, i'm indian they'd be like oh you your rape capital of a country without acknowledging the brutality that women go through in developed countries as well right and and erasing their struggle um so the one thing i learned very early on is that you fight not to win but you fight because you must you must show up because history will bear witness to what did you do when you knew that the people who spoke up and dared to dissent were getting arrested what did you do when you knew that a 21 year old climate activist was arrested for uh, sharing a toolkit uh, by for 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 collaborating with greta thunberg and sharing a toolkit asking people to be part of a democratic protest what did you do when you knew that your muslim brethren were stripped down and asked to show if they were circumcised or not because if you were circumcised and you're a muslim then you were beaten to death by police professionals who were kicking these people and asking them to sing janagana manak and if they didn't to prove their patriotism and then kill them what did you do right what did you do when there was state sponsored violence what did you do when you know you saw sexual violence within your homes 
right? There's a reason marital rape has not been criminalized in my country, because one out of every three men have attested to having forceful sexual relations with their wives. They love to talk about the stranger in a dark alley who's a rapist. They don't want to talk about the intimate circles within our, you know, groups that are raping us, molesting us, uh, uh, politicizing our bodies. So you don't fight to win. You fight because you must. You fight because you must document what you did in history. And you fight because just showing up is, is, is what you must do for the cause. And when you stop, there are repercussions to it. There is a cost to your silence, as Hope said. So uh, when you have a concept of that, and finally, use social media and embrace your righteous anger. You know, I love Mona El Tahavi. She said that uh, she goes against what uh, Michelle Obama says, where she says, you know, when they go low, we go high. Honestly, no, because people of color, the disfranchised people, vulnerable people don't have the cons don't have the privilege of going high. Our lives are being, uh, you know, uh, brutalized on a day to day basis. And you're going to tell the transgender community, the black uh, 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 sisters and brothers, the Muslim brothers and sisters, to be uh, civilized and reach up when you don't even get your hands dirty. So in terms of social media, use it, be unapologetic. There are many people who will double down on your fight and do not listen to the popcorn eating bystanders, right? You know, show me your scars, show me your wounds of what you have are fighting on the battlefield, and then I'll listen to you. But otherwise, don't listen to them. And uh, uh, take safety into account uh, very seriously and reach out to the people who have been doing this and ask them for help, ask them. Um, because all of us, you know, just get by with uh, solidarity. And uh, the only way I think that we can push back against this system, they're so shameless in their discrimination and oppression against us, that the only way we can push back is by using their shamelessness to fuel our fight and double down in solidarity. Thank you so much, I completely agree. I'd just like to take this opportunity before we continue to invite our audience members to submit any questions that they might have through the Q&A function. Um, Amanda, you spoke about how you were not a typical lawmaker. Could you talk a bit more about what it was like for you to occupy that space? <laughs> sure, I walked in. Well, I'll just tell you a story. Um, the first time that I was invited to testify in the Senate, I uh, was the only woman of color and I was younger than the other witnesses by a decade. And when I went in, I was a consensus witness, which meant both Republicans and Democrats had agreed to bring me there. And we were all told to meet with senators behind um, in the antechamber room. And when I went in and I said, hey, I'm here you know, to go, the reception actually refused to believe me, even if I had my invitation. Um, and I sat in the waiting room and I watched them escort the other witnesses to meet the senators, which was quite humiliating. And it was only until one of the senator's counsels recognized me that she was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, you know, and um, ushered me in. Uh, and I, I just, talk about that because what happened was afterwards, I did meet with the chairman um, and I asked for my own hearing <laughs> um, and he granted it. And so when I did this, I brought a full panel of people of color <laughs> back into that very same room. <laughs> And I walked straight through <laughs> with Terry Crews behind me. Um, and, you know, it wasn't questioned then. But what I want to point out is that there's these spaces that are supposed to govern our lives. And yet, inherently, when they even invite you formally, you're not given. You're not given the ticket to actually go be there when you actually are actually supposed to be there. And... It just goes to show how far we are in terms of being able to live up to the meaning of our creed and to this promise of this country, you know, and, and to, to echo what everybody else has said um, in those moments where I'm literally in public about to go under these very hot lights and testify on violence against women. And I still have experienced this intersectional layer of, um, of discrimination. Um, how, how do you cope with that moment? You know, and, and um, I, I just wanna say that the fight is very long, but 
it is so crucial that we remember that no one is powerless when we come together and no one is invisible when we demand to be seen. Um, and so each of us have it in us already to speak up about the issues that we care about. Social media, as you've mentioned, as Trisha has mentioned, is so powerful. Um, recently, I called on the mainstream media to cover anti-Asian discrimination. Um, and uh, overnight, that video went viral. And it's because I turned to social media where the platforms are more democratized, social media can help do that. Um, it's, you know, the double-edged sword of it, um, which helped create this new space um, for at least Asian American Pacific Islanders for the first time to feel like they could speak about their grief. Um, and yesterday on CNN, a reporter apologized to me and I didn't even realize how much that would mean. Um, but, um, but it is so important that we consistently call out people and also remember how powerful each of our voices are already. Thank you so much. I'd like to move on to audience questions to make sure that we have time to answer them. Um, an anonymous attendee has said, thank you so much for sharing. My blood is already boiling. You spoke about the gaslighting and the system which enacts to make our demands for justice seem wild and dramatic. How do you take back the narrative and keep them from defining your fight? Jamira, would you like to start on this? <laughs> um, it's so funny. Over the last five years, well, not really funny at all because people are dying, but over the last five years, if we think about the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, I, I was in um, at protests in Baltimore and Baton Rouge, Ferguson, and then when we look at the protests now, we see the evolution of that work, and a lot of it is because organizers refused to allow the mainstream media to label us as terrorists, even though we were asking for police simply to stop killing us. And so I think the one thing to remember is that every major movement within history, young people, everyday individuals have always been at the forefront of change. We've been able to shift the narrative by continuing to tell our story and not allow the institutions to gaslight us and to put us against each other. And so one of the ways I think to do that is based on what Tricia and Amanda said, utilize the tools that are um, directly accessible to you, the tools that are free, um, that enables for you to talk to your base, that enables for your base to share that message with the larger community that centers the stories of those who are directly impacted and that can really help to shift how people view a particular issue. Um, but, it, uh, but it first starts with you not allowing your story, the stories of your communities to be hijacked by mainstream media, who's just looking to utilize it to make money and to gaslight the work that is happening. Hey, could you say some more on this? Uh... Yeah, uh, well, I, I want to refer back to, to the responsibility of our use with social media. Um, I think it is obviously incredibly important to get control of our fight and the story of our fight, um, just like the Black Lives Matter movement has done um, and has done incredibly success, successfully and well. Um, that doesn't happen overnight, you know, like we all talked about, it takes a great amount of organizing, a great amount of, of people coming together to recognize the one cause, um, to be selfless. Um, what I see, and when I say selfless, what I see a lot on social media is all these breakout groups, you know, everybody has a different agenda and it's hard to form that most important agenda to bring a group together to move forward and create change. So social media is, absolutely incredible to push for change, um, to control the narrative, of course. But what I've also seen is the incredible negative effects of social media, and it has to be used responsibly. Um, I see social media becomes more of a me, me, me platform. A lot of the times it becomes about my story. It becomes about uplifting myself, perhaps my selfish ideas even um, when it comes to sports. A lot of times it's less about the team aspect and more about how can I get more followers? Maybe I can do some silly dance before a World Cup game. And then it, it's more about publicity and marketing and less about winning and less about the culture of winning. And that's what a team sport is supposed to be about. And so I see this not just in sports, but um, when you use social media to create change, um, you have to do it in a very responsible manner. And I think we're at the crux right now where it can go either way. We see the incredible good that it does. And you can see how 
it is enabling other groups um, to polarize, you know, the good of, of certain groups that are, are really pushing for systemic change and fighting the really good fight that needs to take place in our societies and communities around, around the, the globe. But you're seeing right now um, so much polarization um, and it's tough to see, you know, you got the Black Lives Matter and then you got um, uh, really conservative right wing groups, you know, to combat that. And they're using their own platforms and different platforms are popping up all over the place. So I think uh, how we as society are going to really address these issues of social media is, is very important um, because I don't think it's necessarily 100% healthy. And I don't think we're going down that path of continuing down a 100% healthy use of, of these platforms. Um, I did want to point out to uh, the positives that I also have seen in the sports world with social media. And I want to point out um, LeBron James and what he does for social justice, um, what he does for voter suppression, um, what he does for his charter schools in his local communities. He's absolutely incredible and he's done it all through social media and he's also created a platform called Uninterrupted, which allows, instead of relying on mainstream media to tell our stories as athletes, he created a platform for us to tell our own stories. So it, it, it's, um, it's our truth, it comes from our own mouth that can't be um, changed, our quotes can't be chopped up, it can't be put into a different story told by a writer that doesn't know us or believe in our beliefs. So it, it is incredible to see the work that social media can do and all these platforms that do arise. But it also, I think we have to be real. It's very, very scary to see how polarizing it also can be. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we're almost out of time. So I'll finish with one final question from Claire from Somerville. She says, thank you so much, everyone. I hear you and I completely agree. I was assaulted both in France and India, received death threats, etc. Where should we start to make a difference? Any advice on what we could do concrete, concretely? I've been trying to make an impact for, for years. Any piece of advice is welcome. So I'd love, love to end with each of you giving perhaps just one piece of advice that you would give to young people and young women in particular and how they can start to enact change. Uh, Trisha, do you want to start? Um, sure, by uh, first not becoming immune to it. So report, uh, we always ask people, encourage people to report. So um, go to the police station, file a report. If uh, they, specific to India, if they don't listen, tweet about it. Uh, our police is very reactive to uh, Twitter. Um, and uh, make sure you account for your mental health when you're doing this, because it's a, it's, a, it's a tough, long fight. Again, that does not guarantee you any sort of wins or victories. So you have to figure out what justice means for you. Um, and often justice does not mean getting justice in a courtroom, right? Um, so uh, you have to figure that out. And uh, just the first thing that the one advice I would tell you is make sure you invest in mental health care resources. Once you have a strong mental game, uh, that serves as a great foundation for you to fight the good long fight. Thank you so much. Amanda? The cold creeps forward when everyone calculates that it's wisest to stay silent another day until someone takes a torch and charges into the night. So light it up, light everyone up. And also to echo what everybody else has said, uh, joy to me is the most radical form of rebellion. I know that people are at different stages of their own healing you know, and, and what they can give. So just, just know that for, especially any survivors that are out there, you are not alone. You know, I believe you and also, if you're just taking care of you, that's enough. You are enough. Thank you. Jamira? One of my favorite quotes is by Zoral Noah Hurston, who said, if you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you liked it. Um, so to the other panelists, you know, speak up, speak out, um, speak even when your voice shakes. You are not defined by what has happened to you, but you can use those experiences to really help them push change for not just yourself, but for the next generation. And finally, Hope. Um, you guys all said it so perfectly, but I'll just end with silence never changes the world. And just like everyone else said, speak up, find your voice, um, don't remain silent. Um, it will continue to kill you from the inside. So I always tell everybody, find your voice, um, find confidence in yourself and be true to yourself. I think this day and age with so many young girls, we want to fit in. We want to be like everybody else. 
And ultimately that could kill you on the inside as well. So be true to yourself, find your voice and silence never throughout history has never changed the world. Remember that. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining us for such an incredible conversation. And thank you for joining us from home as well. I hope you have a lovely evening.